Hello, everybody, and welcome to day 14 of Jumpstart. Um, we are very excited today. I feel like for me personally, this is the day I was most looking forward to because we have a double header that should be pretty exciting. Um, so first up this morning, as you know, uh, Jumpstart works with the first half hour comes more or less from the collab. You can see the whole Jumpstart schedule. Uh, over in the chat there. Um, so the first half hour is going to be the wonderful Martha Burtis um, when she is done. And again, these are really, really lightning fast. So um, remember that the content is recorded and the decks are all available. So you'll have all this stuff to look at and um, talk about later. If you do wanna talk more about Martha's session, stick around for the debrief um, from 1030 to 11 and we can definitely talk with her more then. Um, and then at 9.30, we will have Mike Caulfield. Um, and I am so excited about that. We will introduce him as we get closer to 9.30. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martha. Thank you, Robin. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a couple of slides for this. Um, nothing really, um, you know, incredibly important on the slides, but hopefully we'll organize um, what I want to talk about a little bit today. So the title of this um, little bitty presentation is probably the most boring title I've ever come up with for a presentation, Effective Planning for Class Sessions. Um, before I go any further, I do want to mention I have captions running here in Google Slides. Um, however, I am not alone in my house. I have um, a 12 year old and a dog and a cat. So if they make noise and you hear strange things or see strange things in the captions, that was them, not me. Um, so why did I wanna talk about this? I think sometimes when we are working through um, instructional design and particularly in the kind of um, environment we've been dealing with with COVID, we're focusing a lot on course design, on kind of big picture course design, the um, overall kind of pattern and rhythm of the class, the major assignments that we're going to be tackling, how we're going to be assessing and grading. And then the rubber hits the road and what actually ends up being stressful is the actual design of class sessions, right? How you get through the 50 to 75 to three hour session that you have scheduled for your class. Um, and that's particularly challenging if you're doing anything that's remotely high flex or bordering on high flex where you're juggling um, students in the room, students virtually, as well as trying to keep in the back of your mind those students who may be have to be participating asynchronously online. Um, when I was putting together the slides, I came up with this idea of, you know, what normal class logistics look like. And the reality is that we're always juggling a lot when we go into class. Um, announcements we need to make, assignments we need to get started, or projects we need to get started, talking to particular students about particular issues, overseeing group work. There's a lot to be done. But, you know, over time, as, as teachers, we've gotten used to those um, logistics and we've gotten better at um, at, at that juggling act. This, I think, is what the juggling looks like during COVID. So we no longer are juggling balls. It feels like we are juggling fire. It is, we are literally having to um, constantly be thinking about uh, what comes next, what's the impact if of what comes next doesn't work, how are people going to get burned by whatever um, goes wrong. So I wanted to really um, think a little bit about, um, about advice that we could provide to faculty to help them get through, not the whole semester, but the next 75 minutes. Um, and I'll preface this by saying, I'm sorry, there is no magical tip that I'm gonna give you today that you're gonna go, oh, that's what I've been doing wrong. All of this is very practical advice, but hopefully there's something in here that resonates with you and helps you to think a little bit about how you might tackle those class sessions. So the first tip and probably the most important tip is to make a plan, which I imagine all of us do in one way or another. We think about um, what is, we go into class thinking about what is it that needs to get accomplished today? What do I need to talk to people about today? What do we need to cover today? Um, what activities or assignments do we need to try and get done while we are together, either face-to-face -face or virtually? Um, 
what I'm kind of recommending here is to be really, really deliberate about this planning process. And the good news is that there's some models out there for this. And there are specifically models out there for this that are designed for high flex teaching. So at the top here, and these slide, this slide deck will be available afterwards, I've put some links um, to some different ways that you could approach this. Um, all of this, I wanna say, because I think she's actually in the room, is inspired greatly by our colleague at PSU, Kayla Gaudet, who works in HHP um, and teaches, um, I believe the TWP she's teaching this fall was on pandemics. So um, Kayla came to us um, in the collab early in the semester and said, hey, I've been doing this thing and I think it might be useful to people. And so we tried to share that and distribute that a little bit among Plymouth folks. Um, so in preparation for today, I asked her if I could um, include it. And of, you know, because Kayla is amazing, she, she generally, generously said yes. I was looking through what she shared with me and it was only then that I realized that um, Kayla had been able to take an example plan that had been developed by this um, educator, Kevin Kelly. Um, and I've put this link here to his website where he break, this is actually a Google doc where he breaks down, um, I'm gonna pull it up really quickly, a planning document for high flex teaching um, for 50 minute classes, 75 minute classes, 40 minute classes. If you scroll down, there's also some, some high flex activities activity examples in here, sorry. Um, Google just wants me to confirm that I am who I say. Um, if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see that the way this is structured is almost like a table in Word where you lay out what are the activities, how much time are you gonna need for this? And then there are columns for what has to happen for synchronous, what has to happen for um, synchronous in person, synchronous online, asynchronous online, so that before you even go into class, you've put down on paper um, some notes and information about how this is going to work and how this is going to break down, what sort of things span across all of those modalities and what sort of things are distinct to each modality that you need to remember. This second link is an example, so useful, of a plan and script that Kayla used. She used these throughout the semester. I just pulled one of them here um, to share, again, with her permission. The third link is to a version of another, a, a little bit more simplified planning document, um, a little similar to Kevin and Kayla's examples that's based on a planning document that I've used for years for my class sessions. It's also a place where I take attendance. Um, I use it as a place to mark um, if students are, are, are there and to make notes if there's something in specific I need to talk to a student about. Um, you know, why I, I haven't gotten that, that the latest version of your paper, check in with that student, because it's so easy in, you know, the, the complexity of the class of what you're trying to do in class to forget those little things that you remembered you need to check in with somebody about. So I use this planning document. I took what I've used for years and sort of modified it, including a little bit of what Kayla um, and Kevin have modeled for high flex. And then the last thing that I've um, linked to here, because for some people, I think the idea of putting together tables and you know something that feels like a spreadsheet about their class just doesn't work with their brain. <laughs> They're like, that's not how I think about my class session. I, I'm not, I'm never going to do that. I don't think it's going to be effective. I won't look at it when I'm in class. It works really well for me. It works well for Kayla, but maybe that doesn't work well for you. Um, the, the last link here, though, is to a link uh, blog post um, example. My, my friend and colleague, Alan Levine, um, when I was asking about this issue on Twitter, reminded me that um, the way that he prepares for class is by writing a really long blog post before he goes into class, where he basically outlines and puts on his website, this is what we're going to do today. These are the issues we need to talk about. These are the critical questions we need to cover. These are the links we're going to be using, resources. And at the end of class, so that's a really useful planning tool for him, right? It works for him on a personal level. It's something he can pull up in class and use to structure the class session. But it's also then a resource both for students to refer back to, but also for those asynchronous online students who maybe aren't present um, and are going to need some understanding of the experience of that class session. So a couple of different ways to think about planning that maybe you can find some, one of these that works for you or something in between um, that will be effective. 
This next one, it's kind of obvious, but it's so important and we can't let it get lost, which is to practice new things, particularly new tech things. Um, practicing can mean a lot a lot of different things depending on on what we're what we're talking about so maybe what you're doing is um practicing how a new technology tool works practicing you know it's everybody's had the experience where you go into a, a technology tool and it works fine but then you get in there with a bunch of people and suddenly new kinds of questions come up that you hadn't anticipated or new kinds of complications they're on a different browser they've got some weird extension installed and it's conflicting with the tool that you want to use they're what they see because they're have a different role is a little different than what you see um, so building in a little bit of time before your class session to practice those things. Um, here at PSU, I just wanted to emphasize that you should always feel free to make an appoint appointment with us in the CoLab. We are happy to work through a new tech tool with you. We can take on the role of a student or a participant. You can take on the role of an instructor. But sometimes it's not tech, maybe it's a new assignment or activity that you're introducing and you just kind of want to walk through the script of that and have somebody else um, give you some feedback on how well this is going to work, questions that might arise that you hadn't anticipated. Make use of us as a resource at other institutions. I'm sure you have people in your teaching and learning centers, your um, instructional designers who can, who can provide similar kinds of support. Or if you don't, even just uh, making an arrangement with a, a close friend or colleague to do that for each other um, as a way to support each other when something really new is coming along in a class session. Um, as instructors and teachers, we're always used to having some kind of backup. Um, that's never been more important um, than in COVID because truly you just can't anticipate if the internet's going to go down, um, if the site that you need to get to is going to load, if some students are going to have trouble with audio or video. There's so many variables that you're you know, you know, so many variables in that like juggling a fire that you're having to contend with. Um, it's never been more important to have a backup plan. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that your backup plan does not have to be really complicated. It doesn't have to be um, an alternative version of the activity you had originally planned with all the same bells and whistles and all the same um, uh, kinds of uh, activities or um, opportunities for students to express themselves. It can be simplified. It can be as simple as having a meta conversation with your students about the topic that you're covering, why we're talking about this today. Even though this didn't work, what would we have done if we could have done this? Um, you can back up and on a day, just have a really meta conversation about the course itself, about your discipline, about your field, about their semester, about why they're taking this class have a list of those backup activities. It's never ideal to have to go to that backup, but it will at least make you feel more confident that if things go wrong, you're not gonna be just left um, feeling really um, at your wits end about how to make, make something out of this class session. Um, this next tip um, is ease into class. I think sometimes the hardest part of these class sessions is those first five to 10 minutes. Um, when you walk into the room or you open up Zoom and you've got to suddenly get everything set up, you've got to make sure people are in the right place, you've got to make sure stuff is loading on your computer, um, that can be really overwhelming. Obviously, you can go in early and do some of that, but some of that is dependent upon the students in the room as well. So think about how you can ease in to whatever needs to happen. Maybe it means giving your students some low stakes individual, maybe writing assignment or reflection assignment that they do while you're getting things worked out. Maybe it means inviting them into the startup process of the class session, right? Designating a student or two who's gonna help you get things um, oriented, who's gonna take over the chat to explain stuff to the online students. Um, ease into that. Don't feel like you have to hit the ground running right as class starts. Um, so think about ways that you can kind of provide yourself an on-ramp into class that will take a little bit of that anxiety and stress off when you're really trying to tackle something complex in a class session. And then this last one, I really feel like I should have like a um, like Kayla should be like my co-presenter actually here because this last one is also from Kayla and I think she was actually inspired 
um, by Barb McMahon, who's another colleague of ours at PSU in health and human performance. Um, and so this has to do with the end of class. You've gotten through the class session, maybe it went well, maybe it didn't go well as far as you could tell. Um, you're feeling exhausted because everybody's feeling exhausted. What can you do at the end of class session to help you understand how things went, but also to think about um, what can you improve next time? Where can you take this next time? Um, so this is about really doing a check-in with your students. Um, so for years, um, from what the way, the story I understand is that Barb McMahon has done these ticket to leave assignments where students at the end of class on a note card would have to write down two to three um, takeaways as well as um, anything, how, how the class had gone, a reflection on how the class had gone and then anything else that they wanted um, Barb to know. Kayla, when she started teaching this fall in the high flex environment, wanted to, to take this practice on and figure out how to make it work for high flex. So the way that Kayla has done this is um, for her in-class students, she still uses those note cards. Um, for the online virtual students, they use the chat to share those takeaways or reflections. And then for the online asynchronous students, there's a form that they can fill out. Um, uh, I think she's using Microsoft Forms for that. I went ahead and just as a resource, resource created like a sample ticket to leave form that um, anybody can go in here. I will say the way that Google Forms works is a little bit different than all the other Google, um, Google Drive kinds of files and documents. You can't um, give people view permission to an, edit, uh, an editable form. You can only give them edit permission. So if you click this link, you can edit this form. I would just ask that you not do that. Um, instead that you come over here and make a copy of it. Um, you can then copy this form, modify it, use it in your own classes as you see fit. Um, but you'll see it's really simple. I did add an optional name field here only because sometimes students might share something that's personal that you actually do need to put a name to the to whatever is being shared. Um, but I think it's important, particularly when you're asking students a question like, how did today's class session go? To give them the option of anonymity if you want honest answers. Um, because sometimes um, if they have to put their name on it, they're gonna think, oh, my job now is to tell you how good you did in class. So I'm gonna do that. Um, so leaving that name is optional. What are two to three takeaways for class session? So this is really about reinforcing whatever it is you did um, in that class session. Um, it's about getting students to have to take a critical moment to reflect. I mean, sometimes, you know, you go through class and students get to the end and they might have done fine and everything was great, but have, do they really understand what it was, like what the critical takeaways of that day were? Um, so asking them to take five minutes to stop think about what they did, about what you had accomplished, what did they learn, what really, what made an impact and share that. Um, Can you go back to the slides because then we get the live captions back. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the second question is, um, so the first question there was about two to three takeaways. The second question um, was about how the class session went. So this really is about information for you about what went well and what didn't. And I know that Kayla has shared in talking about these ticket to leaves this fall, that a couple of times she's come out of a class session thinking, wow, that did not go well. Um, and then has, has, has had students in their, um, in their tickets actually rave about the class and say how much they learned and how much they had appreciated a particular activity. So don't assume that your perception of, of how things went is necessarily the same perception that your students are having. In particular, because you are, go, you are the um, ringmaster here, right? You're the one who's been having to stand in the front of the room or in the front of the Zoom um, and make everything work and make the logistics work. That's incredibly mentally taxing. It's really hard to be able to reflect honestly um, when you've had to have that role on how things went. Um, you know, something as simple as a couple of links not loading can color your perception of, of the class session. And so giving students an opportunity to tell you this is a way to do a little bit of a reality check. They also may tell you when something you thought was a huge success didn't really resonate with them. 
Um, that's going to happen. Opening yourself up to critique um, from students definitely is a vulnerable moment. I've done it. It, it can be hard to hear, but you know the op the opportunity here is that going back to the beginning of this pr presentation, your course is the forest, the class are trees. Um, every one of those classes is what makes that forest over the course of the semester. If one tree falls, <laughs> that doesn't mean the rest of the forest has to weather. It, it's an opportunity for you to take that information, take it forward, think about how you might do that differently the next week uh, or, or, the, or the next class session. And also to think about it in a larger context about the next time you teach this class, what you'll do differently. Um, so using this ticket to leave as a way to debrief, check in and review with your students. The last question on that ticket to leave, I will say is an opportunity for students to tell you something that they, they need you to know. Um, and that's, who knows what you're gonna get there. Um, but I always feel like um, that's such a great question to ask. It's like that question on surveys when they say, what's the question we should have asked you? Um, sometimes we think that we're asking the right questions of students and there's actually something else they need to tell us. Um, but without a way to do that, they don't necessarily feel like there's a space for it. So I think that open-ended third question is a great addition that both Barb and Kayla have emphasized. I will say that if you decide to use that Google form and make a copy of it, you can modify it. You could add in certain weeks real a really specific question that has to do with something you did or something you covered. I wouldn't recommend making it very long, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't customize it and tweak it um, as you need, as long as you keep it in an activity that probably doesn't take more than five minutes for students to complete. And that was a little bit of a whirlwind. I do have a little, I think, I don't know, Robin, do we have like time for like maybe a question if there was a question? Yes, and I have it right here ready to go. Um, it's oh. from Rochelle and she wanted to know how you think about planning in the context of more open, I think, or emergent um, approaches to classes. And I think that's a that's perfect question for you. A super good question. and. Um, so I will talk about this a little bit from my perspective and the planning document that I use for my classes because my teaching tends to be really emergent. Um, when I put together my planning documents, um, and in fairness, you know, I wasn't, those were not things that I generated during like COVID. So it, I didn't necessarily have to be as regimented in my thinking about how this, how all the pieces are gonna fit. Um, but what I would use those planning documents for is um, to create an outline of, of what I hoped we might get to in class, um, but always trying to leave some space for variation and variety. So when you look at those planning documents, um, the ones that Kevin Kelly and Kayla um, have provided, I recommend with all of these tools, never feeling like your job is to shift your teaching to fit that tool. That should never be what you, you need to do, but rather to think, is there a way to make this, to modify this tool so it can work with my pedagogy? So maybe you build in some open-ended activities um, or, or like not really even defined 20 minutes into every class session that's not really defined where you allow for some more emergent activities to come. Maybe you have some different options um, that you come up with and then you're just prepared to know that at a certain time something might get thrown out. The reality is that emergence can't be put in, like you can't plan for emergence in a spreadsheet, um, but what you can do is plan everything else around it, right? You can plan the logistics of starting the class, the logistics of stopping the class, and in the middle you can create kind of a loose outline of where things might go based on where things have gone in the past and then be prepared obviously, um, as is always the case when you're doing emergent and open learning to pivot or shift um, as needed. I think there's also a, um, like not everything emergent has to be spontaneous in the sense that like if you wanted to have a, a, a student co-pilot you could create your plan the day before, assuming you're being emergent enough that you're not doing all of these before the semester starts, right? You make your plan um, a couple days in advance, then you've got a designated uh, co-pilot who's volunteered. There's a little chunk in there of 20 minutes for the co-pilots. The co-pilot plans a chunk of the class based on the rest of the architecture that you've put together, but maybe doesn't even tell you what that plan is. 
that is also a kind of emergence because that student has grown organically with the class content and is telling you where they are at the time and it, when they make that plan. Um, and it allows you know, a little bit more student voice, student participation. The other thing I really like about that kind of stuff is, you know, I, I can't remember, I think it was Joe Moniger who used to say this or someone, Liz could remind me, but you know, you, we all have our bag of tricks and activities and whatever, and my God, we're so sick of them, especially after we've been teaching for 15, 20 years and they come up with fresh um, approaches and all of those things are a kind of emergence, but you can still have students plan them a little bit in advance of the class. I would also add to that, that there's no reason that all of that has to be planned in advance. Um, you know, depending on how much time you have to work with in your class, there's no reason you couldn't go into class and say, hey guys, we need to make a plan for today. This is what we're going to do here because I've planned this and this is what we're going to do at the end. I've planned this, but we've got this 40 minute chunk. Let's talk in the next couple of minutes about what we want to tackle, about what you want to do, about what the online students want to do and literally fill that document out sort of collectively and then use that as the plan for the day. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of planning that you can do ahead of time, but still build space for that um, co-creation um, right into the class. Um, it also gives them a little bit of a view of how the sausage is made um, so that they so that they also understand just how complex these logistics can be. I think they probably know that, but. <laughs> that was uh, perfect and your timing is uh, just right. Um, so with that, I am going to thank Martha and stop the recording.